So chapter three of the book of Micah is what we're going to talk about today. This chapter is one that basically is a continuation from chapter two. This is talking about the judgments against Israel, basically the, the wickedness, the problems that they have, the things they need to be repenting of that they're not repenting of. Verse one, I said, and I said, here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? So this is kind of a rhetorical question to them going, aren't, as a prince of Israel, aren't you the one that's supposed to be executing the law to know how to judge people righteously? Verse two, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones. So this is, they are reversing morality. That good is evil and evil is good type idea. That's what they're talking about here. So continuing with verse three, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. Now you got to look at verse three and go, does this mean cannibalism that the Jews were eating other Jews? You know, that the Israelites were eating other Israelites, basically, maybe. Maybe this is an indication that there was some cannibalism, that the ideas of ritual worship, of paganism and other things got to a crazy dire point. Uh, maybe this is also talking about the, the problems during siege against Israel that sometimes will happen. Uh, but we could also see this from a more metaphorical standpoint of cannibalizing the value of a person. They're literally taking everything they can from these people to enrich themselves. So it's for their own gain, the, like the epitome of the Master Mahan principle. I'm going to take all of your value and make it mine, basically. Uh, verse 4, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. So this is a, a prophecy from God to those false prophets, basically, that bite with their teeth and cry, Peace, and he hath putteth not into their mouths, even, and they even prepare war against him. So they're preaching peace. Okay, the real prophets of God are coming to the people going, guys, we're going to be destroyed if we do not repent. And the, the false prophets are going, no, we're going to have prosperity. It's a peaceful time. It's all good. We're doing just fine. That's the challenge that they're having, basically. Uh, verse 6, therefore night shall be unto you that ye shall not have a vision. So false prophets basically will not have the Spirit of God with them to help them. They're not going to get visions from God. Uh, and continuing with verse 6, And it shall be dark unto you that ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. So again, they aren't talking to the real God to get the real truth. They're not getting that wisdom. They're basically saying what they think in their minds is going to be best for them. Verse 7, then shall the seers be ashamed and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. So even though they're trying to use these divinations, it's not working. They're not getting any kind of a, of a message from God through these ways, basically. Verse 8, but truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So this is a true prophet filled not with looking for divinations, not looking to say what's popular, but filled with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Revelation, to declare what God wants, to see clearly, basically. So he says in verse 9, Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob. So this is a family leaders. And princes of the house of Israel. So this is the government as well. That abhor judgment and pervert all equity. Remember, they're enriching themselves. The wealthy are getting wealthier. The poor are getting poorer. Basically, they're, they're, the wealthy are getting wealthy because they're stealing everything from the poor and bringing it to themselves. Uh, verse 10, they build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. So they're, they're claiming they're doing good, but in reality, they're doing really bad. 
Verse 11, the heads thereof judge for award, and the priests thereof teach for hire. That is the definition of what's known as priestcraft. Priestcraft is a person willing to teach the things of God for money. You pay me, I will teach you the things of God. If you don't pay me, I refuse to teach you. Okay, so, and the prophets thereof divine for money. So again, these are the false prophets using divination tools like opening up an animal, examining their liver, doing the, the you know, rune stones type idea, getting a bunch of sticks, rubbing them together, throwing them onto the ground, seeing which, which pattern they, they lie on. Uh, you know, we see these ideas of divination in lots of different movies and stories. They're trying to use randomness and an interpretation of that randomness to prove what they want or to try to believe or claim that they're seeing that God is sending a message through the randomness. Because I throw these sticks in the air, God will arrange them the way he needs to, so when they fall, he is going to deliver me a message. This is basically trying to talk with God without getting close to God, to have his spirit with you. And that's like we saw here in verse 8, that the true prophet is full of his spirit, full of that the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, which is that spirit of revelation that helps him to see what's going on, having, the, the, having Christ with him in his life. But to do that, you have to change your life. To do that, you have to repent and improve your life and do things to make yourself better and closer to God. Whereas divination, you're trying to learn from God without changing your life, basically. That's the challenge they have here. So continuing on verse 11, Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. So this is them believing that they are, the, because they're the chosen people, that God is there. That's the problem that they're having. And they're going to believe, oh, because I'm chosen, God is going to protect me. No. You're not, you're chosen because you were righteous. If you aren't righteous, you're not chosen anymore. Even if you're from the right family. That's the, the blood relations doesn't make the difference. It's the obedience to God that makes the difference. Uh, so Concluding here, verse 12, Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. So you think about a city being plowed, it's going to be stirred and forced to change. Get them to break their state of mind so they can eventually repent. That's what the Babylonian conquest and the Assyrian conquest is about. Now this is talking about Jerusalem specifically, okay, so this is more of the Babylonian conquest. The whole purpose of that was to get them to change their thinking so that they can get to a place of understanding repentance. God is trying to help them break their state of mind that is accepting wickedness and get them to think different so that they can repent. Sometimes that's why bad things happen to us, is God is trying to shake us out of our state of mind to convince us we need to repent and come back good thing for us to think about. If crazy things are happening in your life, it doesn't seem like things are going quite well. Oh, maybe this is the sign God's letting me know, hey, you need to change. Let's let's change some things. Okay, let's let's work with the Spirit to know what to change, and then we can change and have more blessings from God. Uh, in fact, Sidney Sperry also wrote about this point here. He says, it seems that in the generation of Amos and Micah, the leaders of Israel, tyrants would be a better name, used professional prophets and seers to cloak their misdeeds. Religion, unfortunately, lends itself, or rather its cloak, very easily to the uses of the hypocrite. So the rich and unscrupulous leaders of Israel found it easy for a price to hire professional religionists to cover their actions by flattery and falsehood. The hireling prophet depended upon his rich clients for a living. He could not, therefore, be independent in his thinking and in his judgment. He was high-pressured into siding with the rich, and consequently shut his eyes to the real conditions among the people. Naturally, he could not attack the sins of that of the day that made it possible for his clients to exploit Israel's common people. So when government officials convince religion to tell them that I am doing what's right, you're going to have a problem. 
that might be something for us to think about when we look at religions. Now, not just look at, oh, these other religions are doing this. You know, like we could see sometimes in third world countries, we might see this with Islam or other things where they are justifying themselves, using religious ideas to justify themselves, uh, like in Islamic extremism and things. You could probably say there's an argument for Israel in that as well. Um, a lot of people who are more pro-Palestinian would definitely say Israel is doing that. They're using religion to justify that what they're doing to people. But I would say this exists all the time in Christianity as well. We see it through history of Christianity where like the whole Crusades, the whole Crusades was justified through religion, basically. Uh, and lots of other things that happen like that. And I think we're getting into a, a period where we're going to, in the future, we'll look back and realize that things like evangelical Christianity today are probably hitting a similar situation. And I would say that that also exists within LDS culture and other parts of Christianity, where politics and religion has gotten a little too comfortable with each other. And religion is being the cover for politics to do wrong things. So just my opinion, you're free to disagree with me, and that's totally okay. But I think we're going to find history is going to look back and go, yeah, that didn't work out as well as as we thought it was. It wasn't that people were suddenly being the government people were being righteous and there was a righteous and wicked government people. They were all corrupt. They were just using religion to cover their tracks. I'm sure we're going to see that come out in the future. Uh, but for now, let's jump over to the next chapter of Micah as we continue this story forward.